All right, I know folks are still joining, but we are gonna go ahead and get started because we have a lot to cover and we wanna make sure we leave time for questions and answers at the end. I just wanna start by saying thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jillian Meyer. I'm the Director of National Partnerships and Campaign Strategy at Share Our Strength. Before we dive into the presentation, I'm gonna run through a couple of quick housekeeping notes. We are recording this call and we'll share the presentation and recording following the webinar. As you may have noticed, your lines and videos are muted and they will be throughout the webinar. At the end, we'll have a Q&A with our speakers. So please feel free to send your questions and thoughts through the Q&A button throughout the call. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, my colleague, Ceci, who is on the line, will be monitoring and tracking all questions. All right, let's get started. No Kid Hungry is an initiative started by Share Our Strength to focus on sustainable change. The difference between just feeding a child today and making sure they never go hungry again. As an organization, Share Our Strength is committed to creating equitable and just communities. As a part of these efforts, we teamed up and funded a new survey with the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition on the impact of the harmful public charge rule policy on immigrant families. Our goal was to gain a deeper understanding of the barriers keeping immigrant families from accessing programs that help feed, house, and care for their children. This research will help inform culturally responsive outreach strategies with trusted partners, like the National Immigration Law Center and Unidos US. These survey results will also be foundational to our advocacy efforts with policymakers to mount outreach campaigns to help mitigate the lingering effects of the public charge rule. On today's call, we'll walk through a quick overview on the background of the public charge rule and the scope of the problem. You'll hear about the, how the chilling effect persists and how that affects immigrant families. Then we'll dig into the research and hear Gabe's analysis regarding what we learned. Finally, we'll open for Q&A and then highlight some existing and upcoming resources. I am so excited to introduce our speakers today. First up, we have Ed Walls. Ed is a consultant to the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition, leading its communication efforts. Since 2018, PIF's outreach efforts have generated thousands of news articles, tens of millions of digital impressions, and 266,000 public comments, the most ever on a DHS regulatory proposal. We're also joined by Zyra Diaz Hernandez. Zyra has been with the Hunger Free Colorado organization for almost three years and has dedicated her work to direct client service through the in-person outreach program and statewide food resource hotline. Finally, we have Gabe Sanchez. Gabe is the vice president of research at BSP Research and formerly was a principal at the research firm Latino Decisions. Gabe is the founding Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Endowed Chair in Health Policy at the University of New Mexico and the director of the UNM Center for Social Policy. With that, I am going to hand this over to Ed. Hello, good to talk with you all today. Um, before I get into talking a little bit about PIF, I just want to say thanks to all of you for participating in the conversation today. Special thanks to Jillian and the No Kid Hungry team. Without No Kid Hungry support, this poll would not have been possible. We also really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you and your ongoing partnership and your interest in sharing some of the materials that you all can use to help immigrant families in your communities. As the slide uh, says, you know, PIF is a pretty large coalition now of nonprofits. One thing to emphasize there is that it's really the diversity of our partners that uh, make PIF special and strong, right? It's immigrant rights organizations, it's advocates for communities of color. It's also healthcare providers and health advocates, and it's nutrition services providers and nutrition and you know, food security advocates. And it's a wide range of human services partners who are all committed to ensuring that immigrant families can access the help and support that every family needs to thrive. Um, just a quick plug to join a working group if you're interested in the coalition, we always um, would love more food security partners. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, so the public charge regulation is, is sort of summarized really effectively here. I'm just gonna underscore a few key points. The first really is that the public charge requirement applies in only a very narrow set of circumstances. It applies when a person who already has a visa shows up at a, a port, like a 
land port, a seaport, or an airport, and applies for admission to the United States, or it applies when a person who already holds a lawful temporary status, um, like a visitor or a student, uh, applies for permanent resid residency or what's called a green card. Um, it doesn't apply to almost everyone else, uh, right? So it doesn't apply to most non-citizens, including folks who already have a green card or who hold one of those other statuses like a student or a visitor and don't wanna change their status. It doesn't apply to folks who are refugees or asylees or who have special statuses for crime victims, orphans, or other humanitarian immigrants. It doesn't apply to folks who are undocumented in large part because those folks are largely ineligible for many public programs anyway. And it doesn't apply, especially important to note that it doesn't apply to United States citizens. And, and that's really key because the vast majority of immigrant families are mixed status families where, for example, a parent may be a non-citizen, but one or more of the kids may be citizens. And so it's really important to be clear that this policy has not ever applied to US citizens. It's also true, as the slide suggests, that the Trump Department of Homeland Security did dramatically expand the number of government programs that were counted under the public charge determinations, specifically mentioning for the first time in the country's history, SNAP, Medicaid, and Section 8, which is a housing subsidy program. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the Trump policy because the really the most important thing for folks to take away from it is that it doesn't exist anymore. In March of 2021, the Biden Department of Health of uh, Homeland Security reversed the Trump policy and so we're now back to the old uh, public charge policy that was in place pre-Trump. Uh, however, as the uh, slide describes, the chilling effect, the, um, the idea that one might not seek health care or food security assistance or other social services because of a public charge concern, that effect was much wider than the narrow circumstances to which the regulation technically applied. Uh, in fact, uh, the reach was measured in the millions as uh, the next slide will illustrate. Um, the uh, sort of the first estimate that we got of, of the chilling effect was an estimate by Manat Health in 2018 when the proposal first came out. And Manat guessed that it would apply to as many as 26 million people throughout the country. Importantly, those are overwhelmingly families of color and they're largely families with children. Also important, only about half of the people who Manat estimated would be covered by the chilling effect were non-citizens. The other half of the folks chilled by this immigration policy were United States citizens who live in immigrant families. So an important Note that this, this has an impact on a family by family basis and, and sweeps millions of families in. It's also important to note that beyond the three programs the Trump administration specified in its policy, the chilling effect reached programs that were never mentioned, including the Children's Health Insurance Program and WIC, both of which were never mentioned in the final Trump policy, but both of which uh, had chilling effects. Uh, in summary, before I hand it over to Zyra, the resulting chilling effect cut deep and especially uh, impactfully during the pandemic. We saw news coverage documenting uh, California families going to SNAP centers and withdrawing from the program. We saw stories about moms going to WIC clinics and returning breastfeeding equipment. In New York, HIV positive immigrants reported avoiding getting the AIDS medications they needed to stay healthy because of public charge concerns. Um, it contributed to lower COVID-19 vaccination rates in Utah, and uh, it drove uh, reluctance among immigrant families to seek FEMA disaster relief from the wildfires in Colorado. And with that, I'll turn it over to Zyra, who can talk more about the impact on the ground. Thank you, Ed, and thank you again, everybody, for being here and joining us today. Um, so once again, as mentioned before, my name is Saira Diaz Hernandez. I am the Client Empowerment Coordinator at Hunger Free Colorado. And um, so just a little bit of information of who we are. Hunger Free Colorado is a statewide nonprofit organization. We work with SNAP outreach partners, advocacy outreach organization, and of course our statewide um, food resource hotline. Um, so just a little bit overview on that. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. It's just, um, you know, our mission, Hunger Free Colorado, 
we um, do uh, want to connect people to food resources to meet existing needs and drive policy systems and social change to end hunger. Um, so with that, um, we are just going to talk a little bit of what we've seen on the ground um, since most of our work, I mean, it has to do with a lot of it, but um, through our food resource hotline and an outreach partners in our, our outreach um, program as well, we have seen that you know, through time or over time, we have viewed the chilling effect, of course, uh, through the food assistance lens. Um, we started seeing an increase in the immigration related fear and accessing benefits, in this case, specifically food assistance benefits, all the way back in 2017. And we saw that first when the um, public church executive orders leaked. Um, and then, of course, there have been spikes of you know, here and there seeing that same chilling effect coming and, and going through um, uh, the information that we receive since then. Um, we are constantly speaking and, and talking to our Colorado families that are looking for food assistance programs and trying to confirm, you know, um, any updates on that. Um, but just a little bit to go over it, like Ed was saying, the chilling effect has spread far beyond just those programs listed in the 2018 public charge rule. Um, of course, families, we've seen, as Ed mentioned, you know, families not wanting to apply to other uh, programs like WIC or um, even the school meal application applications, um, programs that do not have any immigration related requirements. And unfortunately, that can be a little bit hard just because we are seeing it not just, you know, in Colorado, but everywhere around. Um, so families that have not been wanting to apply for this also, or sorry, we've also seen families who do not want to access other food resources like food banks or food pantries that mo in most cases do not require any immigration related questions or even proof of identity in most cases. Um, so we have seen a, a, a low on families accessing those. And as mentioned before, those families specifically more you could say families that are mixed status households. And again, um, as I mentioned previously, those are families who have at least one non-citizen or um, one person who does not have a, a status in the household. Um, of course, we have seen that those, um, those situations have gotten better as time has passed. And of course, when the um, Biden administration blocked that rule that no longer included you know, any of the programs before or SNAP in this case, um, we have seen that things have gotten better, but it does still require a lot of information to be provided to our communities, a lot of information and training for our current staff. Um, and for that, Hunger Free Colorado as always, has been training our staff to speak to our clients that reach out to us via our outreach partners, our outreach program through our navigators and specialists, and also our food resource hotline. We also host public education events very similar to this, um, where we speak to our communities or people that are assisting families through the SNAP application or any food resource, uh, food resources, sorry. And we're also constantly creating us, um, food assistance specific materials to fight the chilling effects. And this is something again, that we've been seeing since back, you know, 2017, 2017 till now. Um, so it is very important to know that I think for Hunger Free Colorado, it has been key um, for our organization to connect to communities and really build that um, relationship, that trust to know that it is important to hear the community and then bring back whatever that community is requesting. Um, in our case, it's just constantly, as I mentioned before, training our staff, but also um, providing this information and education for our community so that just as unfortunately this spreads, you know, via word of mouth, um, those um, materials for um, for facts and, and the new rule block and everything can also spread. Um, and of course, um, later on we'll see this, but you know, just if ever it's needed, Hunger Free does offer a public charge um, specific uh, part on their website. If you are looking for any resources or just information on how to um, provide this to your communities as well or for yourself, um, you'll see that in, in the resources links towards the end as well. And I'll go ahead and uh, pass it over to Jillian, please. Thank you, Zyra. And now, I think for the moment we're all waiting for, let's hear directly from Gabe, who conducted the poll and analyzed the results for us. Gabe? Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate 
uh, the warm introduction uh, being included in this project overall. Again, my name is Gabe Sanchez. I'm with uh, BSP Research, and I have the great pleasure of walking you through the main survey results uh, from the project that we were able to conduct as, as part of this overall partnership. I'll give you a, a little bit of a heads up that I'm gonna be speaking for roughly 20 minutes is what I'm shooting for, walking through a ton of data points. Um, I'll note that you should be able to get access to the slide deck after we finish up. Uh, so don't stress out on trying to capture a ton of data points. Um, we'll make sure that you get access to that so you can take a, a look at just the high level points that I'll walk you through today. Um, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time walking through uh, the methodology uh, can obviously answer questions that you might have at the back end in our Q&A session, uh, but want to give you an idea of really the robust sample size uh, that we had for the survey of a thousand completed interviews with adults who either live in mixed status families or who have family members or close friends who are not citizens. Uh, we actually had a, a large segment of undocumented immigrants as well in the survey sample, so it really is uh, very robust. You see the, the survey fielding dates. We did this survey in September of 2021 and used a mixed mode approach where we captured folks on both landline and cell phones, as well as online interviews. We really stress casting as wide a net as humanly possible uh, with our sampling designs, particularly when we're trying to reach out to immigrants, mixed status families, and the undocumented population. Being able to reach people where they are in terms of how they feel comfortable answering surveys is really critical. And at BSP, we really take great pride in that. I'd like to thank the, the funders um, who invested the resources necessary to do this survey as well as it was done. Uh, all of these things require resources and particularly being able to ensure that we had representativeness by having the survey available in all the language that you see in front of you. Again, thank you to the funders for listening to us and trusting us um, in that suggestion because we wanna make sure we hear from all segments of this community, not just those that are comfortable taking the survey in English. Um, you see, uh, we had uh, many response options that gave people the opportunity to pick one, two, sometimes three response categories. So if you see me walk through the results and you see that it doesn't add up to 100%, note that's by design. A couple of things I really want to stress about the sample um, is one, the racial and ethnic diversity of the sample. You see of the thousand respondents, 47% uh, were members of our AAPI community, so that's 470 respondents. 500 were Latino or 50% of the sample, and then the other small segment were made up of other racial and ethnic groups that fit, again, our screening criteria. Uh, given that uh, there's not as much data out there specific to the Asian American Pacific Islander community, I'll spend a bit more time on walking through some breakouts of the results for that particular population. And, and wanna note that although um, I won't spend as much time on the Latino population, the cross tabs, you can do the same exact breakouts that I'll do for Asians with the Latino community um, and if folks have questions about anything that you don't see for Latinos in the Q&A, um, whether I answer it today or send follow-ups to you uh, with some of those results, I'd be happy to do so. We also wanted to give you a semblance of what the folks in mixed status families look like and stress that these individuals have very close ties to the immigrant community, even if they themselves are US born. So you see a wide segment um, are relatively young folks um, who were born in the United States, but who have uh, parents who are immigrants, right? And I, I will stress this at the back end of the survey as I walk through the importance of having some of these folks in our sample, primarily just foreshadowing to that conversation. Uh, many of these folks actually showed up to be more knowledgeable on this subject matter uh, than the immigrants in their network. So we're gonna channel that we can tap into those folks in the network because they're already receptive to this information and lean on them to essentially be conduits or bridges uh, to the other segments of the population who might not be as well informed. First major theme that I wanna tackle uh, with you today as I walk through the results is obviously we wanted to test the chilling effect that Ed walked you through in terms of the definition. So in the survey, we did this in a few different ways. Um, one, and, and really at the forefront of the survey is we wanted to get a sense of specific to the pandemic Right, the question really framed in the context of needing help. Over the past year and a half, did you or your family need any assistance, broadly defined, right, that, that would really help your family in these very difficult, challenging times that we're all living through? You see that at the end of the day, 40% of the full sample indicated that they or their family didn't need any help in terms of, of government assistance programs. But you see the other 47% here uh, directly said, absolutely, over this very difficult time period, they have needed some help in the context of assistance. I will say that 13% that when they were pushed indicated they weren't really sure if they needed assistance or not. Uh, because of social desirability bias, 
always part of the context of survey research. I would interpret those 13% probably do need help, just weren't quite comfortable expressing that, especially very early on in the survey. So it gives us a pretty good idea that a lot of these folks, again, immigrants and folks in mixed status families, uh, definitely need help. Problematic for us, right, and a clear indication that the chilling effect is real and is still in large effect, uh, you see that of the folks who indicated uh, that they needed help, right, 54% positively indicated at the end of the day they got the help that they needed, they were able to navigate the system, they were able to get those resources. The other 46%, right, roughly half, at the end of the day indicated, yes, they needed help, they could have utilized resources, uh, but they did not apply specifically due to immigration concerns. And again, I wanna emphasize that point. Of the folks in the survey who indicated that they did not apply, that 46% specifically said it was because of concerns about immigration and what it might mean for the, either they themselves or folks in their family or network uh, being tripped up in terms of their, their immigration process, right? So again, strong indication that the chilling effect is very real and gives you a sense of how robust it is even at this point, far away from, from the Biden shift in, in policy. Other major theme, right, is, is obviously if we see that challenge, a lot of folks uh, still being fearful of immigration concerns and not reaching out for help, we wanted to give some indication of what's driving that. Is it obstacles? Is it lack of information, et cetera? And one of the big take-home messages is going to be that there's very low knowledge across this population about the shift in policy, about the overall environment, and consequently, all of you folks that we want to thank for being a captive audience could be very helpful in the overall outreach effort. A lot of different ways uh, to measure this in the survey. I'm going to share a few of those with you uh, today. Uh, one big take-home message is when we ask very directly, right, have you heard anything about this policy reversal? Uh, you see that 22%, again, positive number to start with. I always try to be an optimist, even though sometimes the data doesn't give us the opportunity to do so. But essentially, one in five respondents said, yes, I have heard about this, and I've actually heard a lot. You see another 47% said they'd only heard a little bit of information about the policy reversal. And roughly a, almost a third, 30%, indicated they literally heard nothing, no information about policy reversal. When, again, you consider social desirability bias, which pushes folks to, to basically say, okay, they're asking me questions about this. I probably should say, yes, I've heard a lot about this. Despite that, you still see a sizable segment of folks being comfortable saying, you know what, I haven't heard anything about it. Given the sample sizes, uh, we were able to cut the data across a number of different demographics, including race ethnicity of respondents, um, a lot of different background information about them to figure out where our targets and need to be with, with individuals who have heard less than others about the policy reversal. Here you see clear target is going to be the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Uh, those families were more likely to indicate that they've heard nothing about the policy, especially as we relate that to the Latino population. Um, and, and unfortunately, we're more likely uh, to indicate they've only heard a little bit about it, less likely to indicate a lot. Uh, just to give you some other uh, breakouts from the crosstabs on this dimension, there's clearly an age factor as well. Um, younger respondents were more likely to indicate that they've heard about policy reversal. So we know we've got challenges with the older segment of the population. Um, and also when we looked at the partisan dynamics across the sample, uh, whether they were Democrat or Republican, folks who have a party attachment, more informed about the reversal of policy. We think this is probably because they're getting information, good, bad, or ugly, right, from their, their partisan connections. The independents in the sample, much more likely to indicate that they've heard nothing about this. Right. So again, it gives us some indication of where our targets need to be with information outreach efforts. Another way we looked at, right, just overall levels of information and knowledge across this issue, we, we put a lot of these different scenarios in front of people and asked us, as you see in front of you, did they feel that this was correct information, right, that they felt that it was incorrect or if they were um, un unfortunately not aware and not comfortable being able to give us a formal response, right? You see on this specific question, right? We're asking folks at the end of the day, right? Can this cause immigration problems uh, for individuals who are uh, looking for, for federal assistance? Uh, you see some variation based on race with, again, confirming that the Asian American Pacific Islander community are targets for us. Uh, they're not only more likely to get this, uh, get this incorrect in terms of their response, but you see more likely uh, to indicate they're not quite sure at this point 
and, and weren't comfortable putting a response. Um, we asked a number of different scenarios to give us some leverage on how much knowledge there is specific to the policy reversal relative to other issues out there. One positive note that, that Ed made reference to, we're obviously very concerned about what the public charge rule means in the context of vaccination. In the survey, was specifically asked about that. And fortunately, more immigrants in particular knew that at the end of the day, they could get vaccinated, right, and not have to be worried about what problems that might pose uh, for, for their particular immigration case. So there's some positives from the data, but when we just oppose that with this one, we know again, much less knowledge specific to the policy reversal. Good news for you, we didn't wanna just leave you with the challenge and not give you any ammunition uh, for anything to do about it. So the survey actually spent a lot of time uh, focused on messages uh, that we tested in the survey to give you some indication of what messages to use if you're involved in the outreach effort and you want to try to inform more folks in your own professional or personal network about the shift in reversal and policy. Again, we have um, a lot of opportunity to break out these messages uh, for different subgroups of the overall population. I'll spend a bit of time with you uh, talking through these messages. I want to tell you in advance, you're going to see these variations of these same messages a few different ways in the survey. So I apologize if there's some overlap. And in fact, I won't read all of these to you. Uh, because uh, again, I want to save as much time as possible at the back end for Q&A, Q but wanted to give you first and foremost, folks always ask me this, hey, professor, it's great that you've got all these nuances for, for micro outreach efforts, but can you just tell us what at the end of the day were the top performing messages? So here they are for you, right? These were the messages that overall uh, proved to be the most effective with the full sample. Uh, you see uh, on my left-hand side here, the government recently made some immigrant, immigrant families with children eligible for child tax credit payments for up to $300 a month, claiming the child tax credit will have no immigration consequences for you or anyone in your family. Um, you see that had traction regardless of whether or not we're talking about Asian American or Latino American respondents, and you see it performed well overall at 42% of folks indicating that they felt this was a very convincing uh, message theme. Right? So the other one, your family counts on you and you always do what it takes, and applying for public programs like WIC and SNAP will have no immigration consequences for you or anyone in your family. Find out how WIC and SNAP can help you get your family the food that they need, right? I think things that I wanna point out, and I'll elaborate on this later in my presentation, is that in both examples, we're referencing specific benefits that the population uh, can take advantage of. Uh, we've tested a lot of these in different surveys. We, we consistently find that when you're very specific, especially with the resources that folks might be able to gain access to, it tends to be received much more positively than we, if we think about more broad messages or even aggregate out, you know, that there's millions of dollars available for folks or that you could take advantage of for up to a, a very large aggregate amount. Folks tend to be more trustworthy of the information if you're very specific about the policy and whatever benefit is available to them as individuals or families. Other strongly performing messages overall that you see had traction, regardless if we're talking about Asian or Latino respondents, um, really on, on the left-hand side, getting the healthcare you need will have no immigration consequences for you or anyone in your family, and specifically emphasizing the Trump administration policies have ended. I'll talk a little bit about our strong suggestion to go ahead and be comfortable referencing both the Trump and Biden administrations in your messages in a moment. But you see in both cases here, uh, we directly put that information into the message theme and found that it had uh, traction overall with, with the full set of respondents. Uh, the other message here that tested well, again, naming the administration, President Biden has ended the Trump administration's policies that put immigrants at risk if they use specific healthcare, nutrition, or housing programs. It is now legal and safe to apply. Utilizing that language, legal and safe, I think is something that we've tested over and over again and has traction. So again, those are the type of specific nuances to language we would suggest that you utilize um, in your outreach efforts. I know many of you are already running with message themes. If you have questions about anything that you're already using that you might not see in the presentation that we tested in the survey, um, offline, I'd be happy to talk with you about that and maybe figure out how you might nuance what you're already using to be more in line with what we found to be effective in the poll. Because we had the opportunity to speak with in the survey almost, almost 500 individuals 
from the Asian American Pacific Islander community. We wanted to give you the top message overall for that particular community, uh, because again, we know unfortunately there's just a lot less research done with this particular population relative to the Latino population. Um, so here you see the government recently made some immigration families with child with children eligible for child tax credit payments of up to $300 a month. You've seen that message again. We want to give this one to you again, specifically for those of you that work with EAAPI community, recognizing that was the top message overall. Even when we broke that out across different national origin groups within the Asian community, we found that for the most part, this particular messaging thing had traction across the board, recognizing the diversity and variation that exists within that diverse community. Uh, the second highest performing message, you've already seen it, I'm not gonna give it to you again, but it also uh, specifically framed federal assistance programs. So we believe that when you're doing outreach specifically to the Asian American community, potentially thinking about things in terms of federal assistance programs might be a very good way uh, to put those families at ease about the conversation and ensure that they're tracking the benefits available to them and their families. Other messaging themes that you see here, just to give you the snapshot of variation. Again, you've seen at least one of, if not both of these already in the presentation. Uh, so I don't wanna reread those to you, but I wanna emphasize that you can look at in the survey the overall variation and strength of performance, right? Just to give you an idea of how we put this in front of survey respondents. So if we indicate that it was rated as, as very top performing, what that means is we're looking at the percentage of folks who indicate that it's really convincing. You see 40% in this case, or 37% specific to the Asian American Pacific Islander community. We also had the opportunity to find out if it was not at all convincing. Sometimes we wanna know that this might be very effective for a large segment of the population, but could turn others off. So we wanted to have that valence in our response for, uh, categories to be able to give you an opportunity to see at the end of the day, everything we're putting in front of you, we feel very confident that if you utilize these messages, not only is it gonna have traction among the large segment of the population, but you don't have to be worried about it potentially uh, leading folks to, to not trust the message or, or actually could turn some folks off. Everything we're putting in front of you did not have uh, that implication. I think I'm gonna move forward to show you an example of what you can do with the power of the sample size. Because again, 470 Asian respondents, that's more than any survey I've been involved with on this particular topic for this particular subgroup of the overall population. And what that means is you've got the opportunity to look at different national origin groups uh, within the overall population. Uh, so for those of you that might be doing very micro-focused work with different subgroups of the overall Asian population, you can look at whether or not a particular message has traction or not um, by looking at the variation here. So again, one of the messages that you've seen has overall strong traction, right? Stressing child tax credit payments for up to $300 a month. You see at the end of the day, right, there's a bit of variation across the overall AAPI community where it's rated very convincing at almost 50% for the Filipino community, right? And you also see it has strong traction among the Vietnamese population, not so much among Chinese Americans, right? So hopefully just using this as an example of what you can do with the data gives those of you that have the capacity to do really micro focused and specific outreach to different subgroups of the overall population, the data gives you the power to be able to do that. You can do the same thing, by the way, for the Latino population. Um, within the survey, looking at whether or not things have greater variation among different national origin groups. Give you another example, right? When we're thinking about WIC and SNAP in particular, right? We think that this will be particularly effective, again, with, with the Filipino population who indicate 44% see this particular message that's very direct about food insecurity and name specific programs. That's gonna have very strong traction among Filipinos. Again, not as much among Chinese Americans. That good news is very highly likely to indicate that it's an okay, right? It's a, it's a strong message, but maybe not really convincing. So again, more than anything, wanna give you an opportunity to see the power of this particular survey for those of you that, that wanna look at variation and, and recognize that you might be able to see some groups that you're working with within the data and have the opportunity to really say at the end of the day, this is the message that we wanna utilize, not just the, the overall message that might perform well uh, among the pan-ethnic group, but maybe not so much among the community that you're particularly interested in working with. Again, I noted at the, uh, at the front end, uh, my team at least at, at BSP does a ton of 
survey research on this particular topic with Latinos, so I'm not going to share as much of the breakouts with you. Uh, but again, wanted to give you an opportunity to see what the overall strongest performing message was of the Latino population in the sample. And you see it's one that you've seen already, specifically referencing programs like Wicked Snap will have no immigration consequences for you or your family. Uh, that has the strongest performance among Latinos overall, and specifically among Mexican origin Latinos. Again, you can do the same breakout analysis across different national origin groups of Latinos, and specifically the immigrants among the Latino population found this to be very effective, with strong correlation, as you might imagine, with foreign-born status and being Spanish dominant. Uh, this performed very well among the, the Spanish dominant Latinos who took the survey in Spanish. Uh, so that gives you an idea if at the end of the day you want to know what message should we use, particularly for Latinos, this is the one that we would recommend. Want to walk you through some of these messages that we've already seen, uh, mainly to emphasize what specifically about the message do we think that you should utilize. Again, I know a lot of you are going to take bits and pieces of what you're seeing in terms of these messaging themes, blend it with what you're already utilizing or what you might already be testing on the ground in the specific community that you're working in. So just to give you some ideas, if you're going to take bits and pieces of this, this obligation program value message, we think has a couple of nuances you might be able to grab and piggyback with what you might already be working with. First and foremost on this message theme, you see that this notion of a slight push towards obligation, right? Your family counts on you. Right? We're, we're giving folks some confidence that they matter, right? that they have efficacy within their own family unit. And you always do what it takes. right? That's that slight obligation orientation to this theme. And also, again, emphasizing the specific value of a program. right? This program, WIC and SNAP, can help you and your family get the food you need to thrive. Right? Emphasizing what it is that has value to those individuals and their families, we think is going to be key. right? You have to emphasize that there's some benefit. And I think this uh, messaging thing gives you an opportunity to see what that might look like. We wanted to know, right, that I've heard a lot of questions when we've given this presentation and other audiences, should we be specific about the president's name, right, and the administration that we're talking about? We believe absolutely, yes, you should feel comfortable doing that. Uh, number one, for a lot of folks you saw, even if they're informed on this issue, it's, it's that they're casually informed, right? They're not really drilling down and, and tracking this information as much as you and I do, right, in our everyday professional lives. So by referencing the administration, right, President Biden has ended the Trump administration policies, I think it gives folks a timeline to think about this and say, oh yeah, there was a different shift in presidential administrations. It makes sense that the policy environment would shift along with it. The other reason I really want to stress utilizing the administration is we all are going to work collectively to try to get the federal government and the Biden administration to really lead an information outreach effort. So if we're successful in that, and we're asking all of you to be part of that effort, right? if we do that, we want to make sure that our messaging things around this also include the Biden administration positively shifting the policy environment. So that way they hopefully see all that information coming from the administration. They can trust it because they're already hearing from all of us that that administration is responsible for the policy shift. Again, another example of concrete program value, emphasizing $300 a month. At the end of the day, families wanna know if I take a chance, I'm a little bit nervous about this. You're reassuring me that I don't need to be. What's in it for me, so to speak? And messages that really stress at the individual family level, what's the value is going to have traction. Again, as I noted earlier, we've tested a lot of different variations on this. I've seen a lot of messages that might aggregate out, right? There's millions of dollars available to families through the child tax credit programs. Those are not as effective as emphasizing at the individual micro level what is available to you and your family, right? Where this one is an example of that specific and concrete program value. Again, if you're doing your own messaging, maybe take bits and pieces of this that we've tested and proved to be effective and put it into what you're doing on the ground. Give you another example. Some of you might not be comfortable emphasizing the very specific of whether they're federal or state programs folks might be able to gain access to. So this one is a little bit more passive and less specific, right? Emphasizing that you can get the health care that you need and it'll have no immigration consequences for you or anyone in your family, but not naming a particular uh, policy area might be advantageous. And you see, even though it's not quite as effective as those that are specific, still test very positively with the high segment of folks indicating that it's really convincing. 
best messages mix. So across all those different messaging themes that I put in front of you, the take home messages are for emphasis, right? Name President Biden has ended the Trump administration public policy charge, right? Be clear about that. Don't shy away from naming the administrations that we're talking about. Providing a gentle reminder of family obligations, right? Noting that they have efficacy, right? They have power to be helpful to their families. We think it'd be effective. And at the end of the day, again, emphasizing concrete values of public programs. And again, I'll emphasize at the micro level, at the family level, rather than at the aggregate or the overall. Positively, we tested this at the very end of the survey after folks had been informed, had spent about 20 minutes in a conversation either online or over the telephone about all of this information. We asked folks at the end of the day, now that you've heard more about this, does it make you more likely to get help? And you see positively 50% of the overall sample said yes. Now that I know more about this, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, more likely to actually go forward and get the help that either me or my family need. Similar to what we found in terms of overall information across the overall population, although the Latino population was much more likely to indicate that, yes, they would go and, and seek out help after being more informed about this, we see a bit of a gap, right? Almost 10 percentage difference where the Asian American Pacific Islander community positively at 45 percent, but not quite as high as among Latinos. So we know it's going to be a little bit more effort, right, to, to reach out and engage the Asian American population, which is why we wanted to give you so much information in the messaging side of it to give you the tools you need to be part of that effort to bring them onto the table to get them as high as we see for the Latino population. Folks are probably in Q&A going to ask me a bit about why I might think that's the case. Uh, so to just meet that here, uh, we found across a number of different data sets that we think it's because the Latino population has been more the direct target with any inflammatory information and language, particularly as it relates to the political climate about immigration. And consequently, the Latino population is much more actively seeking out information about this because they recognize they might be a greater target. Asian Americans, on the other hand, are typically not the forefront of, of negative conversations politically about immigrants and immigration. So consequently, they might not be as worried about this as Latinos. So again, that gives you some idea of where our target needs to be, more emphasis on the Asian American community. Moving quickly to information sources, if we've given you those messages, obviously we wanna spend a little bit of time talking about how to reach these individuals with these uh, well-tested messaging themes. You see the most common source of information when we asked the, the full set of respondents was the television and TV news, right, at 59%, right? That's not to say that those of you that don't have the budgets, we know getting on TV is expensive and might not be uh, an area that all of you uh, can utilize and emphasize. Uh, so we, we wanna point out that there's less expensive vehicles that also prove to be very effective, including social media, friends and family. Right, so utilizing networks that you might already have access to, whether that's thinking about tapping into social media can also be very effective. And that 59% number, we always have to put some context to that. Keep in mind, because of the pandemic, more people are at home, right? And paying more attention to television than they would be in an ordinary environment. So for those of you that might be scared by this number and say, we don't have the budgets to do TV, don't worry about that. We know that you can be effective in other realms. And one of those is pushing government to provide direct outreach. As I noted, we've been really pushing uh, the Biden administration to take the lead on a very extensive information outreach effort. We know that will be effective because you see 28% of folks indicate that they trust information coming from the federal government, and that's where they're getting their information from, and also 20% with the state government. Right? So those of you that have access points to your state and local government, as well as the federal government, lean on them. Emphasize what you've seen in this poll that although all of you that are on the advocacy side have done the great work to get this policy reversed, our work is not over because unfortunately we need a lot more information saturated within the community. We know that your work, the work that you're doing on the ground moves needles. Right? Many of you work with friends and family across networks, newspapers at the local level, community organizations and nonprofits, all of you that have trust with these particular communities and are already emphasizing outreach efforts, we know at the end of the day moves needles because when you put all that together at 82%, it's more powerful than TV outreach. So keep doing the work that you're doing on the ground. Uh, hopefully with some more of these messaging themes, you can continue that effort to really push 
particularly through friends and family networks, right, this information and saturate this particular population with information to overcome misinformation, as you've seen also lack of information being a challenge for us. This is particularly important with the Asian American population in those families, because at the end of the day, when we contrast that with the overall total population, we see that they rely on their personal networks and social media to a greater extent than the overall immigrant population. So for those of you that are doing that work, continue doing it. For the rest of us, uh, let's think about how we tap into those existing networks, particularly personal networks of friends and family. I think that will be a vehicle for us to be able to, again, help inform the Asian population who you've seen uh, across the, the slide deck already as a target for us because they're more likely to indicate that they haven't heard anything about the policy shift and unfortunately more likely than Latinos to indicate they're not quite sure about whether they can be safe and, and feel comfortable reaching out uh, for, for government assistance because of the fear of, of deportation or having complications with their immigration status or that of their families. Last couple of slides, I promise, and then I'll, I'll close things out and open things up for Q&A. Remember at the front end of the slide deck, I said it was a positive thing that we actually had some US born folks in our sample. The reason for that is we believe that naturalized immigrants and folks that are born in the US might be very effective messaging targets for us to help move the rest of the population forward. You see that uh, US born folks in particular are more likely to be informed on this issue. Uh, we find that across my, my discipline of political science as well as sociology, particularly non-citizens tend to have lower rates of efficacy than their U.S. born counterparts. So those folks that are U.S. born in mixed status families, have friends and family in those networks, might already be receptive and not as worried, right, to be able to, to utilize their networks to get information, translate that information, et cetera. So in particular, U.S. born children of immigrants tend to have more awareness of their rights as U.S. citizens and are more likely to see inequality and justice in the world. And therefore, consequently for us, and the good news, more likely to be champions on this issue. So if you have access to those folks, let's be cautious of the fact that we don't want to just reach our direct targets of immigrants, but recognize, as, as Ed pointed out at the beginning, unfortunately, many folks who are U.S. born or naturalized are still consequently being impacted by the chilling effect. So let's be broad across our information outreach efforts to make sure that even indirectly reaching immigrants through their US born or naturalized counterparts can be very effective for us. So with that, I think this is Ed, an opportunity for you to emphasize some of these points of really emphasizing and turning up the volume. Um, I appreciate you all being patient. I walked through a ton of data in a relatively short period of time. Hopefully it was helpful. I just want to give Gabe a huge thank you for making that sound so reasonable and easily digestible. Um, and just assure everyone that we will be sharing all of this information um, and additionally more resources, which I'll, I'll cover right before we end the webinar. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Ceci, who has been carefully monitoring the chat. And just want to also say thank you all for being so engaged in the Q&A chat function. It's wonderful to see so many questions. Thank you, Gillian. Um, absolutely. We have um, some great questions. We're going to try to get to as many uh, of them as possible, but if we don't, we will follow up with you um, individually. Uh, one question that has continued uh, to come up is, the rationale, or if the if there was a uh, geographic uh, breakdown of the um, of the respondents, and I think uh, particularly, um, you know, if if this could be answered by uh, Gabe. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I knew that one was coming. Uh, there's always I, I know all of you are, are 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 doing work specific to your geographical context. So I will say that we have cut the data looking for either regional variation finding out a different pockets across the country vary in any important way. And for the most part, we didn't find any statistically significant differences. Uh, where we do see uh, gaps, if you will, is largely based on other demographic factors like those that I, I, I provided for you. Age being a big one where we're finding that older segments of this population tends to be less informed, for example. So good news is, not huge variation based on region. So those of you that are doing very place-based work, I don't think you need to be worried about any of these messages, for example, not testing as well in your jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, another uh, 
question, and I think it's uh, it's a really great question. Just to clarify uh, here, it's it says um, so. One hundred percent of the people that needed help but didn't apply said it was due to immigration concerns. Were there any other reasons they didn't apply? So I think that may require some clarification, um, Gabe, on on the the percentage of, of people that uh, actually did not apply due to immigration concerns? It, at least in the question that I, I presented to you, everybody there that indicated that they did not seek uh, resources, even though they needed it, it was specifically because of their immigration status or fear about that. Uh, that being said, I will say, I can't remember if we include all, all of those questions in this particular survey, but I know I've done others. Uh, specific to Latinos, there's clearly a lot of other barriers in terms of getting access, not as powerful as, as the public charge rule. But one of the biggest one we're finding is across most of the country, you have to sign up for this online, right? For most government programs, I think specifically due to the pandemic, a lot of states have moved the application process online. Keep in mind, the digital divide is very real. And the communities that we're talking about are more likely than the U.S. population overall not to have steady high-speed internet access to be able to apply on a computer. A lot of immigrants in particular, if they have access to high-speed internet, as you all know, it's through their cell phone that they're using as a hotspot, not the best to be able to apply for funding. So that's one, as well as language barriers for this particular segment of the population we know is a challenge. I've seen some great examples. Uh, San Antonio, Texas, for example, has been highlighted as a great example, specific for housing resources. They put a 1-800 number 24 hours a day and multiple languages for folks to be able to get help in applying for resources. Long-winded answer, hopefully some of that was helpful. Thank you. Uh, and this is an interesting one, uh, particularly about the messaging. Uh, it says, do you know if the family counting on you question made people feel, feel uh, shamed or guilty? Great, great question, right? I know these things are always like, hey, they tested well, but at the end of the day, do, do we really want to put this in front of folks and, and kind of guilt them in uh, to applying or pushing others? It didn't prove to be problematic here in that regard of, of making folks feel guilty. If anything, and this is why we stressed, right? It's a slight obligation message, right? Not trying to emphasize, you know, making feel people feel guilty, but just starting with that little bit of efficacy-oriented language right, and emphasizing that they have the power in their families to help, right, I think is the way to do it rather than to throw a, a lot of, of guilt at people, especially at the front end of, of a messaging theme. But that slight touch that we did, I think, is the way to go about doing it. Great. Thank you, Gabe. And I think, um, Ed, this might be uh, one that you might be uh, able to, to chime in as well, and we give uh, gave a, a minute here. Um, <laughs> what if uh, you're a state agency in a state where officials in office are still aligned with the prior administration? Yeah, uh, good question. You know, the, uh, there are a lot of immigration related barriers that are not changed by the reversal of the public charge regulation. So for example, if a uh, person is undocumented or has an undocumented family member, there may remain some risks associated with going into a government office and applying for help, right? So um, there are a lot of states where there, uh, of course, the federal agencies are constrained by law from sharing information that could put um, someone at risk, but you know there are risks that remain. Um, so there, there's, I think there's um, good reason for concern for folks who are, are not documented. And, and even if one is documented, um, you know, anti-immigrant actions by state or local officials um, are understandable causes of concern. So we certainly don't want to oversell this. What we do want to send as a message to immigrant families is that the federal policy has changed significantly and not just this one, but um, a, a suite of anti-immigrant policies implemented over the prior few years have been reversed uh, since 2021. And that is encouraging. There are also a number of states that are making um, safety net programs more immigrant friendly. Uh, and all of that, including Colorado, and all of that uh, gives a reason for hope that things are changing in the right direction. Sorry, I don't have a better answer on that one, but I hope that's helpful. 
No, thank you. And I know um, I just I want to acknowledge that we have several more questions, uh, and but we are um, at about time. We will follow up uh, with you afterwards. And just something that kept on uh, popping up in the chat was also in the Q and A was if the information will be available in Spanish, uh, and it will be, and as well as the the PowerPoint and a recording of of the session. And I think, uh, Jillian, you will talk a little bit more too. There's a lot of interest in additional resources and, and messaging, et cetera, to help spread the word. So I think this, this is uh, the perfect moment uh, to talk about what's next. Yeah, and we are so excited to see all these questions because this will actually be super helpful for informing what's next for us. Um, as you can see on this slide deck, we do have some resources we want to highlight that are already prepped and ready to go. For those that might have missed the original survey report, you can find that under the No Kid Hungry Micro Report link. Um, but there are also a lot of resources we're working on now. So you will be seeing a Unidos US SNAP Awareness Campaign in the late spring. No Kid Hungry grants and resources will be made available to support outreach efforts. And I wanna emphasize that this is really the start of our work in the in supporting immigration and immigrant communities. Um, I know there was a question in the chat about, you know, why, why wasn't there anything uh, research done around black immigrant groups? And I wanna assure you that this is just our starting point, but this isn't our end point. Uh, we're gonna continue to push ourselves to broaden the circle of immigrant communities that we're supporting through new research, through new partnerships, um, and we're really excited to hear these questions come in because that'll prompt us to think a little bigger and bolder about how we do this better next time. So thank you all so much for joining us today and please be on the lookout for resources from us in the future. Take care. <laughs>